Welcome to Leave No Doubt, I'm joined by Steve Cook. Cookie, thanks for being with me. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm good, thanks. Yourself? Very well, thank you. Um, <clears throat> dive straight in, Steve, to get us going. Um, the start of your football journey began with making your debut as a 17-year-old at Brighton. In League One, but then after that you spent the next couple of years sort of in and out of the first team squad, in and out of different loan moves, in and out of training, match day squads. What are your outstanding memories from that time? Um, my outstanding memories were <clears throat> training all week for nothing. It was, it was really frustrating. Um, after experiencing such a high at 17, you know, um, to make my debut at 17 against Man City was unbelievable. So I thought, oh, I've made it, I cracked it. I was involved here and there in squads. Went on like a work experience to have them walk lose him. So kind of, I wasn't with the first team. I'd, I'd play with them for like first team exposure. The manager got a sack. Uh, Mickey Adams. And um, that was that really. I kind of had to wait I mean, two and a half years for another um, Brighton appearance. So in, in between that, it was like you say, <clears throat> like I said, five days training. Weekends running around the Withdean track. Then going on alone to Conference South, then Mansfield. Um, the Mansfield bomb sticks out in my mind because I didn't enjoy it at all. I was driving miles from Hastings to train three times a week up there and play poorly. So, yeah, th those those years were outstanding in probably a disappointing way rather than outstanding in a good way. You look back on those years negatively, would you say? No. Um, because the conference football that I played kind of defined the way I'd defend in the future. And then obviously I'd learn how to become a, a footballer that played out from the back and kind of add layers onto that. So my experiences were now really good because I went to East Wombara for a month and loved it. Um, played for Eastleigh and really enjoyed it, having more alluvial on, on loan experience. And then I had obviously a bad loan at Mansfield for three months, just purely because I didn't enjoy moving away from, from the South Coast. So, uh, yeah, they, they weren't, they were, they were good experiences for, for where I am now. Um, obviously, the only bad one at the time was Mansfield, but, um, you know, that, that adds layers on to you as well. I think the situation is, the reason why I've asked you, um, obviously having known you very well as I do, the situation now is incredibly common. I've, on the drive up here to, to today, one of my friends has a, a good podcast called Baller Talk and they were having a conversation just recently about how can you train mental toughness and arguing that some, one of the guys was arguing that you can train and one of the guys was arguing that you can't. You have to experience those things and come through the, obviously the other side of them to, yeah. to know what it's about. Um, Youth and under-23 setups now that obviously you were involved with at Brighton at the time mean kids are going in and out of first teams, in and out of training environments. They might make an appearance like you did at, a, at an early age and then struggle for another one. Um, how important do you think it is that players are developing mentally, not just obviously football-wise, um, to allow them to be able to deal with all the ups and downs that they're going to go through within football? Yes, yeah, huge. So I'm on my A licence now and we had... Um, conversation about this exact thing about under 23s youth teams going on loan into the non-league um, and I think it's massive going on loan and playing competitive football I think the under 23 league yeah it's really it is good it serves a purpose for you know learning how to play how your manager wants to play at the time but these players that are coming through Man City Man United Arsenal Tottenham Liverpool are they making it into the first team um, it's very difficult it's just um, more more often than not they're not so they're being coached the perfect way the football way the playing out for the back the, but then you're going into league one league two conference conference south north and these teams aren't playing the same way because it's impossible because of the quality of pitches or the opponents so going back to what you're saying about training players and mentally and that they have to experience both in my mind you have to experience it to learn from it um, 
I'm obviously very pro loans because I've done it and then ended up playing at a good level. Um, and I've seen players that are better than me not do it and dwindle because they're not up to the competitiveness of playing regular football and the criticism you get and the exposure and how easy it is in 23 football it's, it's perfect to plan on amazing pitches against top players with top players I think that's the easy side of football the hard side is testing yourself and going on loan and having experiences and growing so let's explore then for obviously for, for the listeners benefit that loan that you did have at Mansfield that obviously didn't go as well as you possibly had hoped it would at the time but in hindsight obviously it's been a big benefit to you in terms of your mental toughness um, because we've all been there in football when you're going through something and you think you know football is, is highly emotive it's the end of the world if it's if things are going badly you lose a game you don't perform very well it feels like it's the last game you're going to play during that time how did you manage to, to to deal with those emotions or did you I didn't I text the 21's manager at the time Luke Williams saying can I come back I didn't enjoy it I said no I got a, a Dealt with it, paid. The Mansfield manager got the sack. We got kicked out of the stadium. That was locked. We had no training ground. We trained in a Xbox arena in Derby. I was going goal. It was not football how I imagined it. You know, <clears throat> Gus Poyer coming to Brighton. They started playing from the back. They played nice football. They ended up promoted. I was at Mansfield till January experience obviously what I was and thinking oh, I might as well just go back and play for the 21s it's, it's nice but I wasn't able to which was a good thing why was it a good thing because I was out of my comfort zone and I wasn't able to do what I wanted so then I was there so I had to graft I had to train I had to try and play well um, and I went back to Brighton in January a better player better person and then I was able to kick on and, and have a fairly successful season without playing another game. I didn't play at all. I went back to the 21s and, and trained and played in the reserves. But I was a level above the other players because I was used to tough, strong football. How long did it take you to realise that that Mansfield loan was a positive in the end? Because obviously when you're going through it, you don't know that. You're talking about it now as if it, it, you know, it gave you positive experiences in terms of learning how to struggle or or how to suffer in terms of footballing reasons. How long did it take you to realise that, that you'd actually learned off, off the back of that experience? Um, a while, probably. I went on loan to Bournemouth, I think, maybe 18 months later. Um, and loved it. Was that the next time you'd played a competitive game when you went to Bournemouth? No, so I saw out the season after January. I returned to Brighton. Saw out the season in the reserves and 21s. Was then in, involved with the first team that pre season. Made a Carling Cup appearance against Liverpool, actually. Um, then went on loan to Bournemouth. How important do you think is it for players to learn to become uncomfortable? I mean, like just off the back of you there, talking about. The, you know, you text the, the 21s manager, you wanted to come back into a comfortable environment where you knew you'd be okay. But off, but by not being able to do that, you actually learned more. Players now going through all these emotions and, and are, who are experiencing circumstances that, that they might not like. How important is it that they, that they understand that football isn't perfect, it's not easy, and more likely than not, you're going to have more downs than ups. Well, look, the dream is you, you come for the youth team, you play for the first team, and you retire at that first team. But that never happens, really. You don't get it often. What you get? Steven Gerrard done it. Don't really, I can't really, off my top of my head, it doesn't work. That's not how it, how it is. You have to have experiences for me to become a better player, to, to grow. You're never going to stay at one club. You're never going to have an easy ride. I think it's never an upwards trajectory, a whole career. Um, 
So these little down moments, these moves, these loans, kind of prepare yourself for what's out there. So obviously I was at Bournemouth for 10 years, but I had a lot of loans before. And then when I've moved now, I was ready for it because I knew what I was facing. Obviously it's 10, 11, 12 years later, I thought I was ready to play for a new club. I think that's the, the major benefit of obviously this conversation that we're having together and certainly why you know, I'm so excited to get into the details of your career is because you've had these experiences at a young age where, you know, it's not been perfect. You weren't the, didn't come through Brighton's youth team and as, as top boy and, and the guy who's gone straight into to all the league games, um, you had challenges and you, and you had, you know, you had times where you have just told me times where you've struggled, but you've just left a club after 168 Premier League appearances, the, the most Premier League appearances at that club, a legend. It's, you know, so you, you are, you are the, the advertisement for young guys going through those circumstances that you can come out the other end successful. Yeah, I think, um, see, I love non-league football. I think there's so many kind of uncut gems, unpolished, you know, diamonds that are ready to, to come through and just have that challenge. But, and that's why you, you get that now. I think if you look at it, sometimes if you start at the top, these players end up in the conference and you see players in the conference rise up and go through the leagues. It's kind of a, a reverse kind of journey because the players in the conference are, are fighting. You know, in the league, you've seen there's so many players coming through now, like even like Bardi, Antonio. They're, they're top Premier League strikers, but they have to do it the hard way. And they're ready to grind. I think sometimes it's too easy through the academy system to be sold a dream to then like Crystal Palace have done a, a new thing, haven't they? The, which is amazing because it's it is tough when you come out of the big teams. Obviously, I haven't spent a bit of time in the car this morning. Not only did I listen to the Baller Talk podcast, but I had Gary Neville's uh, Overlap podcast on, and and he was talking to Declan Rice about Declan um, about his journey being released from Chelsea, having to move to, to West Ham and almost being released from West Ham. And there's a moment where, and, and this is, is, is in no way saying that obviously coming through non-league um, to play at a, at a high level is the best way to do it. Like there's some guys, obviously you say, Gerrards that go through the youth team, have successful careers in the first team. There's no right way or wrong way of doing it. Obviously we're just discussing the, the, a certain pathway. Um, but Declan Rice was, was speaking about and when he was 16, there was other boys in his youth team that were given youth team contracts and pro contracts. And he was just given a youth contract. And by being just given a youth contract, it said it made him more hungrier to succeed, To that he felt like he had to catch the others. And by catching the others, he actually overlapped the others. Um, and I think obviously it's something that, that you did. Um, and in your career, I'm interested to know that obviously League One Championship um, you played with a lot of guys that sort of had similar backgrounds in terms of every, all the guys had a lot to prove and, and managed to do that. But so when you were in the Premier League and you, and you start to play and be teammates with the guys who haven't done that journey and who did have it all very early and had the perfect route from top academy, are there any differences between the two when you reach the top level? No, I think the, the, the general consensus is you have to be hungry and want it. Um, top players learn, grow, uh, are starving for success. So as, as good as, uh, I'm going to probably contradict myself, you know, like coming through conference, players are hungry and want to get out and play the highest level. But the, the, the thing that separates, I think, players that start at the top that don't end up at the top is the hunger that they still want to, Go higher than that. So being in on 23, sometimes you can feel that you are there, but you're not. There's still so much more. So the players that come from the top, stay at the top and go again. Um, like you say, Declan Rice, he had that little bit of you know, doubt in his mind, but he was still at the top. He's still at West Ham. But he wanted more than the two years scholarship. He wanted the, what his mates got. And that's the difference. And then he got there and he's gone again and he's gone again. You know, he's a regular for England, captain of West Ham. So, as much as I said, yeah, you can, it's easy to drop off from that level. 
if you've got that right man mentality of, you know, I want to be the best, I wanna, I'm willing to learn, I'm willing to graft, you stay there. Did you always have that hunger then? I always had the dream of playing football. My dream of, 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 of football was to play professionally. And I loved playing football. So my hunger was to succeed wherever I was. And my transition kind of went so quickly, I didn't realize kind of what I was doing. So I was playing every game, obviously League One, Championship, played in the Premier League. And it was just, it happened through riding the wave, obviously the demands set by the management, me being able to kind of physically do it and mentally cope. Um, so I don't know really, it was, um, the demand on myself always obviously come through from, my, from, from me and respond to criticism from the manager or not playing well. So in those early days of your career, we're talking about obviously the, the period of time just before you went to Bournemouth, that in and out of Brighton's first team period. What do you know now that you wish you knew then? I wish, so the game changed. The game changed from a lot, I think, in the last five years. So I, I wouldn't say what would I do now that I didn't do then because I don't think the game was at that point. Sports science, the lower leg gym work, the prehab wasn't huge when I was 20, 21 starting at Bournemouth. So I felt, I feel like if that was, if I was 21 now, you'd be doing it when I was 20, 21. We didn't do it as much. There wasn't a big demand on the off field stuff. Yeah, you had to be professional and you know, recover, massage, treatment, do your upper body stuff. But now it's so in-depth, you get all the stats, you jump in, you get jump scores, you see how well you can recover. And the game, the change room's changed. There's a demand, there's a competitiveness in the gym now that's improving players and getting more out of footballers and prolonging their careers. So I think, to answer the question, I wouldn't, I wish the game was at, the place it is now rather than me not doing it. Yeah. Would you argue that the word busy was used a lot doing extras and was almost frowned upon by others like, oh, he's doing extra. And now there's no way you can be successful without doing it. No, 100%. I think it was the old school mentality of train, train hard. If people were doing over the top, they would be called busy. Um, which is a shame and it's an old school mentality now busy is good you want to be busy you want to be recovering you want to be training you, you're leaving the training ground three four o'clock because you've been in the gym doing your lowers doing your power doing your body fats are done all the time trying to jump higher than your mate yoga pilates you know everything like that is good and that's what is making footballers so much more than just being athletes and footballers now. So was it, how did you feel then, obviously when, because when you started your career, similar time to me, obviously different levels in the end, but the, that old school mentality of not doing extra was there and then it started to creep in and now obviously as we're, we're both, you know, sort of 30, 31 year olds, 28, 29 year olds, that doing more is a necessity when did that click for you? How, do you remember what sort of age or, or what sort of stage you were at? Not too long ago, to be honest. Um, so for me, it was weird because I didn't do lower leg weights. Then I did. Then I got injured. Probably naive thought it was because of the lower leg weights, but it's probably because I wasn't used to it. So it was that build up. Um, injuries, my biggest injury changed how I looked after myself. So I never had injury. Then I got one big one and then, you know, they, they come, you have to look after yourself more, you have to strengthen things. So, you know, I'd probably say in the last three, four years, it's not a long time really, maybe less, because now I'm conscious of where and how, what I need to do to keep up with these young players. So at 26, I was naturally fit, naturally strong, 
didn't get injured. 27, got an injury. Then the whole perspective of playing changes. So, you know, things change in physiotherapy and recovery and sports science, and I quite enjoy that now. So um, I, I know if Dan Hodges ever listens to this, he'll be like, what is he on about? He hates it. Um, but then for the last 18 months, I'm well, two, two and a half years, I'm just, my legs are strong because I had a hamstring injury, but now I've done all that stuff, upper body, body fat's lowest it's ever been, and I'm obviously 30 now. So um, it takes time, I think, to, to learn that. But I think it comes from having to do it sometimes. So what does a Steve Cook routine look like now? It's a long one. I'm in early treatment, prehab, uppers before training, or train, treatment after, ice bath, hot bath, lowers, power work, you know, I do I do everything that's available now, yoga. So a busy footballer. Can you give us an insight into a little bit more detail, just in, in, in case obviously anybody our age, lesser age, wants to to take from you what you're doing into their own game, like from step by step in the morning. Can you can you tell us how, how yeah, your morning so looks? Um, <clears throat> obviously get up, travel in, uh, always grab a coffee in the morning, uh, always booked in with the physios for either you know, chiropractor or massage or um, stretching work. Then I would go into the prehab room and do some mobility, depending on what day it was. Um, I usually like doing upper body weights on a recovery session, um, but I usually try and get two in in a week. So I'd either do, depending on time, on meetings, my upper body work and core work before. Then um, the football side of it, obviously the, the meetings, um, the training. Uh, try and train as uh, as intense as I, as, as I can, depending on the day and the lead up to a game. Um, obviously before that we do pre um, the prehab team sort of stuff anyway. So you have your own individual stuff that you do before the team prehab? Yeah, so... And who sets that out for um, you? I've taken kind of bits from prehabs that I like doing. So you've taken that responsibility yourself to create your own program? Yeah, so you, I'm, you kind of get guidelines of what you kind of need and then you, I just take stuff that I like and what I've done and what works for me. Um, then you do obviously the pre, prehab with the team. Uh, train... And depending on the day, so I like doing lower work, lower leg work, like on a Tuesday before a Saturday. So how many days is that? Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Um, so any day later, I wouldn't do as much. I'll still do it, but less reps or less weights. So a lot of power stuff, Nordics. I've had hamstring injuries, so quite conscious of my hamstring work. Um, so the power stuff, I think, is good. We do a lot of jumps that kind of measure your recovery um, and whatnot. Um, yeah, and then see the physio again. Do you feel, obviously it's very difficult to compare from when you weren't doing it to when you are doing it because of your age and obviously the, the difference in clubs and obviously training and, and stuff like that, what you're supposed to do at one club to what you're supposed to do at another so it's a difficult question, and I understand if, if it's a difficult one to answer, but if you had done all this at a younger age, do you think you'd have felt or been able to perform better to a higher level, become a better player quicker? Yeah, probably. Well, no doubt, yeah. I think um, maybe I wouldn't have had the injuries that I had, or maybe I would have... You know, been able to perform better on the day, um, recovered better. So yeah, a hundred percent. So I had a good, I've had a good career, and I played um, a lot of games in that time. So it's difficult to say that I would have been a better footballer. But I think I probably would have given myself a better chance of performing and recovering better because I played in games that I had niggle. Or you're always injured as a player. You always, always got something wrong. But maybe I would have been ten percent less stiff or 
wouldn't have had a grade one calf injury when I shouldn't have had one. So little things like that, yeah. I'm eager to explore um, stepping away, obviously, from, from your routine and stuff and, and how you've developed that. I'm eager to explore the moment in which you signed for Bournemouth the first time. So you obviously came on loan from Brighton, um, had a successful couple of months. Um, and then for anybody listening, I want to obviously give them an insight and a background into the situation that you were in. So you went back to Brighton and actually played in a championship game against Southampton. Was it just after after New Year's or, or sort of New Year's, yeah, New Year's Day, Day maybe? Think, yeah. And um, performed well. Was offered a new contract by Brighton. Off the uh, even before that, was offered a new contract by Brighton to stay there, and offered a contract by Bournemouth to go there. And you literally had the option of which one you wanted to do. How did you manage to come to the conclusion in which you did? And what was your thought process for anybody who's indecisive about two options that they've got? Um, what sort of stuff was going through your mind, and how did you decide what you wanted to do? So. One more for in League One at, yeah. at the time. For being able reason. to stay at Brighton was my dream. That I wanted to go on loan to Bournemouth <clears throat> to give myself the chance to play for Brighton. So when they gave me the opportunity to do that, it was, I was like, okay. I'm swaying towards that. But then the manager said, oh, look, we, we want you to stay, but you know, you're going to be in the team at the start. I can't promise you that you're not going to be on the bench in a week's time. So I thought to myself, oh, maybe they're just offering me this contract because they don't want to let me go, but they don't want to let me go somewhere else and do well, if that makes sense. So I knew instantly that Bournemouth were desperate for me to sign and I was just desperate to play football. Because I've obviously gone long enough without, and I'd loved my loan time at Bournemouth. Kind of really threw myself into it, and actually loved being involved in a, a first team um, experience. So that made my mind up. I was I was ready to challenge myself and ready to enjoy a first team role rather than a backup that potentially I wouldn't have played again. So playing football only was all that mattered to me at that time. Um, how many things go into making a decision like that? What sort of stuff do you have to think about? To be honest, at that time, I didn't have to think about too much because it was just myself. I had no responsibilities. So obviously my mum and dad and whatnot were in Hastings. Bournemouth was a nice place. The, the only thing I thought of at that time was football. So I, I, it, wasn't a, it was only a difficult decision to make because I loved being a Brighton player. That was it. And I kind of wanted to play for Brighton because I'd come through the youth system. But when there was an opportunity to play regular football and give myself a chance at Bournemouth, it was a no-brainer. Obviously, we know right now that you've had an incredible Bournemouth career and I've spoken about it on other podcasts and not just because we're close, but you could arguably be their best ever player. It's You know, it's your time there was incredible. But do you ever wonder what might have happened if you had stayed at Brighton? Yeah, because Lewis Dunk, who's my friend and who we come through together, is captain and played in the Premier League and is an extremely good player and he's had that journey. So, yeah, I think um, naturally you do. Obviously, I don't know what my career would have looked like. But, yeah, I, I think of things. I think of things. I had opportunities to leave Bournemouth um, two, three, four seasons in. And I always think about what, what would have gone on then. So... Um, naturally you think about what, where your career might have gone or might not have gone um, but my decision back then was the right one I mean, um, I would never have changed anything A lot of people may have, like similar to yourself may have had options that they've not taken um, and might dwell on that decision and, and constantly think what if or what might have happened did you find any benefit in, in doing that or, or how did you get over that quite quickly? No, I, I never thought about, I never regretted the decision, so I've never thought about what could have happened. Obviously, I've thought about what could have happened, but I've never thought, oh, would I be in a better place now? Because I was lucky enough to have an amazing career at Bournemouth. Um, I had the same when I left. I could have stayed at Bournemouth for, for six months and played because they had a dip and I could have played in that team. But potentially, 
um, going to get promoted, but my decision was my decision to move, and I don't regret anything. I it was the right decision for me. You know, you know deep down if you're doing the right thing, and yeah, I think you just have to back yourself. I think a feature of and hadn't planned on on discussing it with you beforehand, but a feature of your career has been taking up challenges and and overcoming them quite consistently. We've just spoken about your young age. Um, your experiences at Brighton as a kid, having to go on loan when you didn't really want to, you, you, you know, you could have easily stayed at Brighton as a, as a young guy off, off the back of that deal, off the back of playing a championship game against Southampton, but you chose the challenge of, of going to Bournemouth and being a first team player. How much benefit for people listening is there in, in taking on a challenge rather than just taking an easy route? Yeah, I think it's huge. Um, I think any walk of life, you have to challenge yourself to see what you can do. So, Football's no different to, you know, challenging yourself if you're, if you're working in a supermarket, you know. Um, you get offered a managerial role in, in, in Tesco's and you think, ah, oh, do you know what, I'm, I'm actually all right on the tilt. But you never know what you can achieve by becoming that manager and taking over, you know, other units. It's like football. Are you happy in the 23s? Yeah, you are. You're solid. And potentially if you go into a first team, you're leaving yourself exposed because maybe you're not good enough, but you don't know that until you play. You you don't know what capabilities you've got <clears throat> as a person to to step up. If you fail, you can always go back. Um, football, you can, you can fail and drop down to another team and do really well because your surroundings are better. So, yeah, I think any walk of life, you've got to challenge yourself. Of course, at one point, we were obviously going to get into your Bournemouth career and, and the influence of Eddie um, on you. Because having been there at the time, obviously, when you signed, you went straight into the team and, and, and were fantastic. Um, but as much as people might think, oh, Steve Cook was a Bournemouth for 10 years, super successful. The start of your Bournemouth career, for whatever reason, off the back of that loan and Lee Bradbury leaving as manager... There, you know, you did have a challenging time. Obviously, the, the Paul Groves became the manager. For whatever reason, you weren't as much of a main player as what you were. You played left back, right back instead of centre back. Um, and then Eddie came in. What do you think changed, obviously, for you and your football when Eddie became the manager? Um, yeah, and I still had to wait a few weeks under under Eddie, I didn't play straight away. I had to because the team started winning, so I had to be patient. Um, but the demand on me, the the demand on me from Eddie, demand on all the players from Eddie and his coaching staff was huge. And you only made it if you was able to cope. I think, as in the physical demands, they obviously liked me as as a player as well, so that helped. But. The demands and the mental demands that they, they posed were was really hard and I was fortunate because I didn't pick up any injuries through their first, you know, lot of training. I stayed fit, came into the team, got fortunate so fortunate someone's downfall was always someone's, you know, benefits from it and Miles Addison got injured and I come into the team and never come out. Um so you need that luck as well. Obviously, under Paul Groves, before I wasn't playing, they signed Tommy Elphick and Miles Edison, and that was their kind of sort of a partnership. And it was kind of, even though he wasn't performing, they'd laid out a lot of money for Lee One to have them too. So, um, yeah, I benefited off someone else's misfortune and was lucky enough I stayed in the team and didn't get injured either. You're talking, I want to explore that a little bit more. You've mentioned the mental demands and physical demands that Eddie and obviously Jason and the, and the staff that obviously came in at the time put on you and as the team as players. People, fans, if they're listening to this, players that obviously understand that Bournemouth went from League Two to the Premier League, fairy tale story. There's obviously method behind the madness. You guys obviously were training to win games. Can you give us a little bit more detail um, as to what you mean by physical demands and mental demands? Oh, we the physical demands speak to itself. We ran every day. We passing drills with the skies running. With the, the intensity of training had to be quick. You know, rondos, rondos that most clubs they use for a laugh. Rondos that 
Bournemouth under Eddie were not. That was a proper session. Um, you had to sprint in, you had to react to losing the ball. You couldn't dwell on things, the passing drills. The mental side of it was they had structure. It was like NFL, like they had plays, like how they, the movements and the triggers and they had them named after players, do you know what I mean? So, yeah. but uh, Carlos was uh, him going inside or the Cafu going higher or Burkamp coming into the 10. Um, so it was all plays. It was mentally tough. The training sessions were long. Two and a half hours, then you'd run, then you'd be in the gym, then you'd be training the next day, two hours, smaller side, smaller drills. It was, it was hard, really, really difficult. Um, you you had to train tired. We done a lot of team bonding sessions. We walked around Wareham Forest for four hours doing orienteering. Um, so it was. The demand and the expectations were, were huge. How did you manage to obviously use those experiences to develop as a player? Or do you just think I was improving because we were winning games on a Saturday? Or did you feel specifically you were performing better? You felt like a better player? Yeah, I felt obviously a lot fitter. Um, you couldn't relax because you, you knew you'd gone if you, if you didn't perform the, the the amount of players that come and went in my time under them was, was huge. And some players didn't even kick a ball um, just because they couldn't do it on the training pitch. So you'd be written off from playing at the weekend if you couldn't handle the training. So, um, yeah, the demands were massive. Obviously, we were bottom of the league, second to bottom in League One. He came in and we ended up going and beating for 24 games, you know. So it was like, OK, if I work hard, we'll succeed. And that's where it's always been with me. We've both seen it throughout our career, obviously different clubs and people listening to this will see it, the clubs they've been in it. People who don't take training seriously, as I'm going to use Bournemouth as an example, the guys that, that weren't serious in training or didn't perform in training, didn't run as hard as everybody else in training, what happened to them? They were gone. That was simple. You or you ended up working hard in training. So you otherwise you you either left behind or you got on the train. So it was nothing. There was nowhere in between. You were trained well. Eddie and JT, Perchy and, and Tinners, the coaches, they preferred training to games. So you had to do that as well. You had to train well. There was a leaderboard. Every win, every goal was recorded. There was a leaderboard of who's got the most wins, who's got the least, who's conceded the most goals, who's scored the most goals. The league and the training was more competitive sometimes than, than match days. Eddie used to come off sometimes like, why are we not playing like this? Why we're, we're Players are fighting on the training pitch, but not fighting on, on the match pitch because training was so intense. I'm going to bore you again with, with something else to listen to on the way up. Obviously, the drive was long, but I had Eric Dyer's high-performance podcast on as well. Caught just the start of it. Mm -hmm. And he's talking about how Pochettino had them so uncomfortable in training that games became easy. Um, and now, obviously, this podcast is, is supposed to be a benefit to people listening to improve their own football. We're talking to you about your training standards and how that ended up having a positive impact on your match days. How important would you say that even if for whatever reason your club's training environment isn't as intense as what we're talking about, Bournemouth's, mm -hmm. that you take it as seriously as you possibly can to have a benefit on you on a match day. Yeah, so I don't think it's um, just an Eddie thing or a, a Bournemouth thing at the time. I spoke to sports psychologist Dan Abraham and he was like, your work is in the week. So you train well, then yeah. you enjoy the game train well if you perform well in, 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 in training you're not going to play well every game on the weekend if you train well obviously but you give yourself the best opportunity to perform well on a match day because a match day you've got your team training is you you are trying to get in that team so the week is your work the Saturday is your enjoyment is your game 
what you've worked hard for. So what do you think it was about you? Let's evolve, obviously, a Bournemouth experience now. You've been promoted out of League One, as, as you just said. You went unbeaten for 20-plus games. You're now a championship player. How do you, I mean, we've spoken about it before, but for the benefit of everybody listening, how do you manage to deal with success like you did? Because it would have been the first time you'd, you'd obviously experienced promotion and then go again. Because I thought, oh, if we can do this, we can just, you know, we just enjoyed winning. You know, like we... I always saw as the championship was a top, top league, that if I have a career in the championship, it would be amazing. I got to the championship and we was playing games and I thought, okay, I can do this. I can play. I was playing well. I was enjoying it. The first season we started okay. Then we ended it really well. It was like, okay, what, what can we do? And it was like a bit of realism, like, okay, I can succeed here as well. So it was more so the team, obviously being in the right team under the right manager and realising that we could go to the next level and see what we was like there. The same week could go to the next level, obviously Bournemouth as, as a club, as a team did. But I'm interested in you specifically for people trying to relate to you. What did you do that allowed you to, to start competing successfully in the championship, obviously off the back of being a League One player? Nothing. I didn't change. I, I just kept playing my way. I backed my, the way I played then. To be good enough to play against the players I was coming up against. So physically I wasn't the strongest, but I always had a good amount of pace and I like playing football the right way. In my mind, sorry. Um, so I didn't change anything. I, I just backed myself. Um, obviously, I had to learn along the way of areas you could play in and, you know, natural progressions of, of playing the game. But I didn't feel like I needed to change my game to to go up the leagues. I just felt like I had to improve on the bits that I was good at. So what were the main differences for you then, obviously, from... League One to the Championship and then from Championship to the Premier League? So it's commonly spoken about, I think, the quality of... So well, I'm a defender, so obviously the quality of strikers improves. The, 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 the pace of the game, the, the ruthlessness in both boxes. Um, that was... That if you can be clever, be quick against, obviously, top strikers... You can progress. I was in a team that played very open. And we conceded a lot of goals in the Premier League, but we conceded a lot of goals because we were very attacking, not because we couldn't defend. So, um, how did that make you feel when that was up? Because oh, yeah. Bournemouth as a team were spoken about by pundits, obviously during that time of they'll concede goals. Mm -hmm. For you as a defender, like, did how did you take that? Yeah, hard because. Felt especially defense a bit disrespected, but kind of depends what team you're at. I look at Leeds now and the Bielsa, very attacking, take goals, but they get praise for it. We were very attacking, conceded goals, lost games for it, and were naive. So it depends what way you want to spin it, I suppose. Was there ever a, a moment that you, I'm not say that you challenged the manager on it, but was there ever a moment you thought, like, what are we doing this for? Like, no, because we'd had so much success. We always backed ourselves to win more games and pick up enough points by the way we were playing. So we got, I think the manager got criticised because we weren't willing to change. Um, but why would we? Because we had so much success. The reason we didn't have success and went down was because of, I felt, that not solely because of us it was outside influences it was decisions it was VAR um, COVID so I think the way we played and the way the players went about their business on the pitch was was successful we've spoken quite a lot about how you developed as a player 
during that period of time, I obviously your training standards got better, all the extras and uh, and you know the demand on you mentally as well as learning the game was was much bigger. But also, obviously, having been around you at the time, you grew as a person. You grew into into a lot more responsibility than what obviously you had when when you arrived. You you ended up being um, the captain more often than not. Obviously, I know that Simon Francis was the was the club captain for a while, but for whatever reason, when he wasn't playing, that you played that role um, and then played that role for for many years after after he left. Um, I'm really. I want to get into with you what a good captain, in your opinion, looks like and how you developed your own opinions on what a good captain is. Yeah, so obviously in the time that I played at Bournemouth, Tommy Offick and Simon Francis were the main, the main captains. So polar opposites, Tommy was very vocal, um, a motivator, equally trained and looked after himself as a proper pro. Frano was not vocal. Um, he was a leader, as in the way he performed each week, the consistency, the way he looked after himself, the way he acted around the place. So two different types of ca- uh, characters and captains, but a common theme of the way they looked after each other and the way they acted around the place. Um, so then I kind of thought, right, if I try and take the two and put them together that's the kind of captain I would be. Not yeah, vocal in the training room, I was always fairly vocal, um, vocal on the pitch, but standards of you're not going to play well every, all the time, you're going to make mistakes, but people can't out you because you've done everything right. So I've trained well all week and i played well. Brilliant, I'm a great captain. Um, I've led the line, I've spoken in the changing room, and they're like, oh, brilliant. I've trained really well all week, made a mistake, played rubbish, still vocal because that's how you have to be and you're a good captain because you're not hiding behind things train terribly have a good game yeah he's a good captain right because he was on the day he was on it train terribly have a bad game don't say much you can get criticized because you left yourself open because you're not training well so i just tried to train well do everything possibly right around the change room, conduct myself well around the town and give nobody an excuse to say to me, well, you haven't done it right. Um, and that's what I took from both of them. That's what I took from Eddie Howe. Yeah, look, 100%. I just, people make mistakes out of football as well. Um, but it's trying your best to do everything right. Obviously, it's not going to happen all the time. You know, Different emotions and different weeks and whatnot, but I think if you can stay consistent um, and be open, be able to talk to people, I think that's a new role a captain takes on now because there's a lot of young players, there's a lot of exposure. You can use your experience and help and be open and talk through different scenarios. You know, that's the that's the new the new role. I think you were always vocal in a changing room. Before games, obviously, you, you I wouldn't argue that you were outspoken, but you, you said the right thing at the right time. Um, and I remember admiring you for that. Um, can you give us an insight into into what your role as a captain looks like before a game in the changing room? Um, I think the captain, the, the changing room's um, a strange place on, on match day. So I don't like a changing room when it's quiet and no one's saying anything. But equally, I think you can get lost in just saying rubbish. So some players like to be sat on the headphones and listen to music. Some players like to be on their own. Some like the noise or relaxing and whatnot. So I think you, uh, normal captain day for me was being relaxed until I was changed. And then you kind of trying to say the right things, trying to drill across where we're at or what we need everyone wants to win but you've got to write you got to know why and what you're doing it for um, so yeah it was more so trying to take the Tommy Elphick side of things without going too over the top and then focusing on my Simon Francis side of things and performing well so how did you manage to get it right between 
being outspoken and giving the team information and then feeling like you needed to obviously treat young players or whoever it was. I look, sometimes I don't know if I got it right. Sometimes I thought to myself, am I doing the right thing? So, um, Were you conscious of it? Did you, th- did yeah, you have to think before you spoke? But I spoke to Tommy when I was peeing captain and he said, just don't change anything. Just, you've got the captaincy for the reason. So for a reason. So just do what you're doing. And yeah, a hundred percent when it goes wrong, you're like, oh, am I doing the right things? But if you're honest to yourself and you you know that you're trying, you can't please everyone. In football, it's impossible. You're going to have to have arguments in the changing room. You have to have arguments on the pitch. That's why you like don't leave yourself open to any criticism from the people that you're saying it to. Everyone has bad games. No one can say, "Oh, well, you played bad last week, so you're a bad captain." They can say, "Well, you you haven't you didn't do your gym, you didn't do your recovery. That's why you played crap." That's what I never left myself open to or tried not to. A lot of teams do this and, and Bournemouth certainly do. They have done for, for a long time. Uh, you know, I was, for a period of time, much many years ago, was involved in some of them when, when a huddle before a game, mm-hmm. before the kickoff. Obviously, Tommy would, would lead those ones back then. He was the captain. Um, I myself have, have led huddles, obviously, in, in latter stages of my career my, with my role at Eastleigh the last couple of years. When you take a huddle, a team talk before a game, I'm interested to know, how do you decide what you're going to say? How long do you think about it? What In what manner do you do you deliver your speech, obviously, to the guys? How difficult is it for a captain to get that speech right? So I remember my first ever one. League one, I think I was 20, 21. It was horrific. The league, it was a league one game? Yeah, yeah. So I think I was 21. Um, and it was real bad. Because I thought about it too much and when I'd say it, it went bad. <laughs> I could do remember what you said. I can't remember. It was like, who's going to help us? And I was expecting someone to be like, that's us, and it was nothing. <laughs> so it was a terrible, it was a stinker. Um, so I actually dreaded huddles as a captain. And then I thought, do you know what? Don't think about it. Feel the game. Feel where you feel and, and just say it. And then obviously I went on to be captain quite a few times. Some games I'd think about it. Um... Other games I wouldn't think about at all, and I'd get to kick off or the, the coin, car, coin, car, <coughs> coin toss. I'd be like, oh no, I haven't thought about anything. I'd just wing it and just try and again. Sometimes it was difficult because I'd be speaking in the change room, so then you'd be going over old ground and you'd be saying the same things. But it was more so players. Like, I feel like players like huddle before they like that little bit of aggression a bit of a buzz before they I might be totally wrong but I like a, a captain's talk before a game in a huddle of how important the game is we need to work for each other and the, the, the usual rubbish but it, it's true you must have delivered obviously you were captain for a long time many obviously high profile Premier League games do you remember any that stick out in your mind as as being very inspirational or, or not really? No, not really, I think. Not 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 one. I can't really think too many that have kind of stuck with me, but obviously in that game of the, the adrenaline going and, and whatnot, um, I wouldn't say there's been too many bad ones. You've obviously had um, the experience of playing under Tommy and playing under Frano, as, as you've spoken about. But for other guys who, I mean, you, what I mean by this is you had a positive experience under captains. Some people might not. Mm-hmm. And when they become a captain, how do they really know how to become if they haven't had a positive experience off the back of someone else? So my question to you is, how can somebody learn to be a good captain if they've not had the experience of playing under one? Yeah, I, I just think, going back to what I said about you don't change, you get a captaincy for a reason. So whatever you are putting across to the players, that you that's how you feel. So I don't think any captain's got to be outspoken. I don't think any captain's got to give you advice. I feel like a captain needs to be able to be consistent performing-wise on the pitch and, and off the pitch. And then whatever comes along will happen. You, you get confident, you, you end up 
taking huddles or you're not speaking to people or you're taking advice off. Equally, the manager will advises you, I'm sure, of of because you're next down, you're the manager on the pitch, so you, you're taking his expectation, his responsibilities onto the pitch and you're taking his characteristics and what he wants as well. I'm going to move it on a little bit because I'm interested to to ask you about your time in the Premier League because for everybody listening, you know, the pair of us lived together for many years, just a couple of normal guys enjoying their, enjoying their youth, trying to obviously be, to become players. Suddenly, you know, you're, you're a Premier League footballer and, and you're super successful. You've become an incredible player. Was there ever a moment, and I'm interested to know, was there any moment that sticks out for you that you got the opportunity to reflect on where you'd come from and think, wow, look at what I'm doing? Um, not until lockdown, I think. Um, because it was so quick. It was so season after season, expectations after expectations. The summer came and went because you give yourself 10 days and then you were planning for the next season. Um, so no, not until probably COVID. And it was like, oh, and we was on the brink of relegation. It was like, oh, how hard did we have to work to get here? How much you had to give to, to be where I am. So I don't want it to go away. That was kind of my thoughts. And we had the three months of no football. It was like, oh, I miss football. And then Bournemouth at the time were putting like reruns of games on. And it was like, oh, okay, oh, we were amazing then. Or I played well that day. Or I'll oh, look at the scenes when we got promoted. And it was quite, it was nice. The amount of success that you have had during that period of time obviously wasn't short of setbacks. Um, most recently, obviously, injuries that that you sustained in, you know, in big games, obviously that playoff semi-final against Brentford, huge game, really bad injury. Um, everybody will always talk to you and obviously you've just left the, the club and I've seen all the interviews about all the success, but like I said, it wasn't short of, of any setbacks. How did you manage to, to overcome those setbacks time and time again and remain as obviously as successful as you have been? The, well, this is, uh, the biggest setback, the biggest down I had, obviously, obviously getting relegated, was was getting injured in the playoff semi final and not being able to contribute for the final, uh, for the for the second leg and, and get promoted. But that hurt because I I do feel that if I played, if I was fit, Bournemouth would have been promoted and we would have we we ultimately failed that year. Um, and I was captain, first full season captain, and we failed. So. That was a big disappointment. I was out for 14 weeks after that. Um, and it led to where I am now because I wasn't involved for, for months after that. So what spurred me on was my me wanting to prove people wrong. Because Even was, after everything that you'd done? Yeah, because it hurt. I was only 30. I've still got a lot of football to play. Um I think some people wrote me off after playing, being injured, especially maybe within the club. Um, uh, what gave you that impression? Uh, like well, I wasn't it? involved, so for no reason. So it was, um, I was very motivated to get back playing and get back in the team and prove why I should be on the pitch. That's that hunger, obviously, that you've got in you again and, and always rising to a challenge. Do you think that's within you? Like a, hopefully there's a lot of players listening to this, it might not be, hopefully there is. But can you teach hunger or do you think it's just in you? Mm, I think it grows because I wasn't probably like that as a kid. If I got dropped, I'd be fuming. I was, f I hurt big time from not being in the team. But then I didn't show it in my training. I, I made him real. So I used to think, oh, if I'm dropped, I sulk on the pitch. I let them know that I'm annoyed. But people know you're annoyed because you're not in the team. It's football. So I thought, right, I'll just try and take my game to the next level, trying to do everything even better. Um, and I got my chance eventually and played really well for Bournemouth in the, in the games I did. And ended up signing for Nottingham Forest, which is a huge club, because of what I was able to, where I was able to keep myself mentally, physically, and be ready. Otherwise, I would have just failed. I'm going to go into detail about that a little more. So I think it's an amazing conversation to have for, for people to get insight into is that club captain 
been involved in all the club success for, for the last 10 years and suddenly off the back of an injury finds himself not involved. You're then called upon for a couple of games and the, the game that I want to talk about was, you know, was on telly, away to Fulham, they're top of the league, first versus second and not just because we're close but you were sensational on the night. I remember celebrating your blocks like I, I had scored a goal myself, like I was super proud of, of the way you performed after all that had come before that. Um, in terms of you not being involved, the people and this is the, and the reason why this is so important is because you who have had all the success that you have trained hard for that moment to be able to prove people wrong and prove that you're still the guy that can be successful. How hard were those months? What were you going through mentally, and how good did it feel after that game? Yeah, the, the months and days were really hard. But I didn't show that ever once I got out of my car at the training ground. So I'd wake up, be angry every morning, be down on my journey in, get out of the car, and I was on it. I was ready. I was doing everything possible. I was biking in the altitude before. I was in the gym. I was training unbelievable because I was so ready for what I knew was happening. There was no way I couldn't do anything else. So the window shut, but I had no, what else was I going to do? So I thought, okay, I'll improve. I'll be better. I'll prove them wrong and wait for my chance. I knew I'd get it. And, and I knew how angry and disappointed I was. I, when I got the chance I was never not going to take it Talk to him about that night at Fulham then how, like, how did you feel before? I, I knew I'd play well